I just want to let you know that you are a son of God. So can you say to your neighbor, you are a son of God? And that's Galatians 3.26. The reason why I'm emphasizing that is because when sons of God are manifested on the earth, you will find that it's a setup for the second coming. The Bible says creation is crying out for the manifestation of sons of God. And unless you and I start to manifest on the earth, and when I say manifest, that is very particular. Manifest not in humanistic mentality, but manifest in the spirit, manifest kingdom mentality. And so I want to draw your attention to the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel 6.16. This morning it is imperative that you understand what God is saying. In Revelation 3.3 3 it says, He that has a year, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And so every time we hear God, He's always speaking because He has something in His heart. There is intent when God speaks. When human beings speak, sometimes we find that's a whole lot of nonsense. But when God speaks, there's always intent. He's always got something he wants to speak to his people and this morning he wants to speak to you and I believe this will help us transition into who we should be and what we should be amen we are coming from a place of of the old order the Aaronic priesthood but we're coming into the new order called the order of Melchizedek when Jesus came on the earth the Melchizedek, the Melchizedek order came into being and what is the Melchizedek order? It's, a, it's an order after righteousness. See, for a long time, people have been taken lightly. I'm talking about God's people. They've been taken lightly. The reason is that they've become so complacent in the things of God that they don't want to hear God's people. They don't want to hear God's servants. They don't want to hear God himself. But we, it's, it's imperative that the church rises with a scepter in the hand and with the dabar on their lips and begin to speak as thus said the Lord. And that's why this morning I want to speak to you about an incomplete transition and then we will speak about a complete transition. An incomplete transition that means there was a transition but it was incomplete and anything that is incomplete doesn't look good. A few years ago I flew to one of the African states in, in the north of Africa. And one of the things I noticed in that country was that there was a lot of buildings, three stories, four stories, five stories, but once you get to the third and fourth floors, they were incomplete. And it didn't have a very good look. It didn't look right. The, the site wasn't good. So when you drive through, you always see all these incomplete buildings. So I asked the pastor, so why are these incomplete? They said, they have this policy that in order for you to finish the building, you have to have a, 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 a special permit to operate. But as long as the building is incomplete, you can still continue using the facility and always tell them that, because you get, a, you get what they call a temporary permit to operate, and that can last forever. So what do people do? They use systems for their own benefit. And we've become accustomed to that. All right, so this morning I believe that as we hear God very clearly, we will hear how to transit from a place of the old order to the new order, but it must be a complete transition. Good morning. Amen. And so it's a privilege for me to be here this morning. What a privilege, sir. Pastor Ziggy, Pastor Rose. I've been friends with them for many years, even before Joash was born. Where's Joash? Somewhere in the back. Oh, in Sunday school, okay. And so, in, in the time I've seen how this church has transitioned from when they first started, from one order to the new order. From an old mentality to a new mentality. And remember, along the way, you're going to find there's going to be a lot of changes. When you married your wife on the first day, and you look at, for, for some of you that are married 40 years, 30 years, 25 years, 10 years, you noticed the transition, right? From the day you met her, from the day you married her, up to now. Much transition has taken place. And how many lives you've seen 
there was incomplete transition and there's parting. Whenever there's an incomplete transition, there's always a parting. And that's the reason why we have to understand that when you put your hand to the plow, you cannot turn back. Because the Bible says if you put your hand to the plow and you turn back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. And so if you come with me to Second Samuel chapter 6 and verse number 16. Second Samuel 6, 16. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. Some of you say Michael, some people say Michal. Okay, this is the original way of pronouncing it. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the, the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. And so I want to talk about an incomplete transition. Let me show you something. The Ark of the Covenant was in transit from the house of Obadidom to Mount Zion. Okay, so the previous migration was interpreted by the death of Uzzah. Remember Uzzah? When the, when, when the cart that was holding the Ark of the Covenant was going and it, uh, it almost toppled over and Uzzah put his hand to stop it from falling and he died instantly. What was, what was the reason for his death? Do not touch anything that God said no to. The instruction was very clear. No hands shall touch the ark except the ones who are bearing the ark themselves. And Uzzah was not bearing the ark, he was walking along the side of it. In other words, God is saying that when I am in charge of anything, I'm in charge. And when I give an instruction, it has to be carried out. Your help is not needed. Uzzah thought he could help God by protecting the ark. No, God is the protector. Are you with me? Even though it seems as if the ark is going to fall, you've got to trust God that he knows what he's doing. That's the reason why when God said to Abraham, take your son and go sacrifice him. And Abraham followed every instruction God gave him. Why? Because he knew that when God said, I will make you a father of many nations, God will not go back on his promise because if I kill my son, I know that God will raise the son up because how is the word of God going to become a reality? But man today doesn't trust God by his word. Because we use a lot of cliches today. God is faithful. God is awesome. We sing songs. We, 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 we pray. We use prophetic word. We use it. I didn't say you prophesied. I said you use prophetic words. But what do we do? When it comes to really believing it, we've got a problem. Because it's easy to say things, but it's very difficult to believe what we say. And so there's a company of people that are already in the space where they believe everything that God says. And when you believe, even when it's absolutely ridiculous, you will know that God will come through. How do I know that? Remember the lady with the oil? She had the last bit of oil. What do you have in your hand? I have nothing, sir, except a jar of oil. What did he say to her? He gave her instruction. Okay. Tell your sons to go around to all the neighbors and collect as many empty jars as you can and bring it into the house. 
And when you, your house is full of jars, you've got no more space, close the door. So take the oil and start to fill all the empty vessels. Mervyn, that's the most ridiculous instruction you can give somebody. It's like Mervyn coming to me, or it's like pastor going to Mervyn and saying, Mervyn, how much of coke you have in your house? You said, I got only a two liter. Okay, send your wife and all the children out and bring as many empty jars as they can. So you didn't go bring two liter empty jars. You went and got five liters, 250 liters, 100 liters, and he brought it into his garage. And he said, okay, now, pastor, say to him, now when you get all of that, pour that two liter into everything. When pastor leaves the house, you will say, I'm not going back to the church because he's a ridiculous man. That's how it sounded. That's how it must have sounded to the woman. But she did not ever think like that. What did she do? She obeyed practical instruction. In fact, that was, that's what we call explicit obedience. And we find that is lacking in the church. It's lacking in the church. There's a lot of things lacking in the church. That's why we call it an incomplete transition. Anything you put your hand to, finish it. See it to the end. Complete the task. But when you look at the church, when I say church, I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ at large. Wherever you go, whether you're going to Malaysia, you're going to Singapore, you're going to the, to the West, to the, you're going to the UK. Wherever you go, you'll find churches, you walk into a church and you'll find there's always incomplete transitions. Why? Because people don't believe the word like the way they should. People sing the songs, they say amen, but they say amen to things they really don't believe. Because most of the time the pastors tell you, say amen. You say amen, but you're really in your heart. You don't agree. Because what is the word amen? It's an agreement to what is being said. I stand with you in agreement. So when the ark of the Lord came over, there, the, the, there was a transition from the house of Obadidom to where? To Mount Zion. Somebody say Mount Zion. David was switching places. He moved the ark from where? From Mount Gibeon. Now Mount Gibeon was an old order. And he's moving it to Mount Zion, the new order. What, what does Zion tell you? Zion is a picture of what? Of a place in the spirit. When God talks about He's talking about a place in the spirit. That's why we are sons of Zion. We are sons of God. Where do we live? We live in Zion. We, 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 we move in Zion. We think from Zion. We speak from Zion. Zion is a spiritual position. Even though in David's time it was a literal physical place called the city of Zion. What was in reference to? Is that in that place we live and move and have our being in God. Are you with me? But when they left Zion, the presence of God was still there, but the people was out of the presence. Old order. Oh, are you following? But what was David doing? He was setting up a, an entire infrastructure to show the people how to transition from Mount Gibeon into Mount Zion. But when you leave Mount Zion, Mount Zion leaves with you. You have to understand that Mount Zion cannot be a visiting place. It's not a place of visitation. It's a place of habitation. So when I get to the place, when I leave, Zion goes with me. It means that we live in the spirit. Why do you think we were speaking in tongues? Like when we started church. Back in the days, people only spoke in tongues from time to time. Now we live in that place. Why? I saw a bodybuilder here somewhere. Dashan. Okay, there's it. Dashan, would you stand for a second? Check his body. Check his build. Now, he, uh, he, he looks good. Thank you. He looks good. Why? Because he's been working out consistently. When somebody works out consistently, what do you see? Development. In many places. Like I love to have that body. But I don't have the time to go to the gym. <laughs> so what happens? I've been developing, yes. I eat and the stomach comes out. But he's, he's got a special type of diet. See, if you keep at it, I can think 
about his body and say, I wish I had that body. But if I don't do something, he is doing something. If I copy that, if I do that which he is doing, that means plan my times, plan my eating, plan my day accordingly. I will reach that goal. Am I right? The church has lost it. We don't. You know what we, when I say church, you know what we think? Church meetings, coming to service. When we talk about church, oh, he's talking about Sunday, maybe Tuesday prayer meetings, or maybe the church is going to have some program. See, that's our problem. Our mentality is so, so much in Gibeon, the old order that we don't understand when you are speaking from Zion. Take two groups of people, Mount, Z Mount Gibeon and Mount Zion, and you listen to the conversations. One will be speaking in the Spirit, from the Spirit, by the Spirit, and the other one will be speaking about the Spirit. To the Spirit. Oh, come on. We need to come to Mount Zion. The city of the living God. Somebody say city of the living God. Because when you come to the city of the living God and you step in, what happens to you? You become fired up. You become living. When people look at you, they want what you have. They want life. You're a life-giving spirit. Do you know that? Somebody said to your neighbor, I'm a life-giving spirit. So if you're a life-giving spirit, everywhere you go, anything you release, anything you speak, anything you say, has to give life. That's why the word dabar is so important. God said in Isaiah 59, 21, as for me, this is my covenant, would you say the Lord? I'll put my spirit in you and I'll put my words on your lips. What is his word on your, on your lips? Dabar. What is dabar? The creative latent power that's in a word. That means you have the ability to speak things and it will come into place. But most people don't believe that. See, when you get up in the morning, one of the first things you should do is learn how to speak in tongues. Fashion your day. You don't have to speak loud and disturb everybody in the house. My mother is very good for that. Until we have to tell her, Mom, it's five o'clock in the morning. God can still hear you. Be still and know that He is God. Because she'll be going around the house, and we will say, Oh Lord, not now. We, this is the best sleep. And you know, when you come to five o'clock in the morning, that's the best sleep. Even if you have to get up at half past five, that five to half past five, nobody should disturb you because a pot will land on the head. Because that's how important it is to many people. And so, what do we do? Get up in the morning and learn how to talk to God. Learn, how your, learn, uh, and learn to train your spirit to connect with God. Because when you set that right, the day is right. The moment, see, you have to know, if you set your day right, by doing the right things, your end will be awesome. You'll have victory at the end. Most people want the victory, but they don't want to prepare. Preparation meets opportunity. If you don't prepare, how are you going to come into your your glory into the grace that God has given to you. Hello, if you, are, if you run the 100 meter or the 200 meter, right, where do you have to start? At the end or the beginning? You can't come in between. Hello? Most people don't like to start at the end. Most people, I'm sorry, at the beginning. Most people don't like to start at the beginning. What they do, they say, I wish I could start halfway. Why? Because I don't have the stamina. That's our problem. That's what the church is lacking, stamina. How do you get stamina? Start praying. Start praying in the spirit. Start the day with praying. Start your life in praying. If you keep going, somebody say to your neighbor, keep going. You see, too many people have told you that you're useless, you can't, you're, you're nothing. You know, sometimes it's the very people around you that will call you useless, that will call you, uh, oh, why, why are you so spiritual? Why are you acting so spiritual? That's a word from the devil. When people tell you, you know what, what are you acting so, so holy for? You must know immediately that that's not an agent of God. Because an agent of God will tell you, will, call, will, will actually help you in the process. When they hear you speaking good, they will speak good. When they hear you in tongues, they will start to speak in tongues. They will join you in tongues. When they hear you pray, they will pray. When they hear you confessing God, they will confess God themselves. That's what you call partners in destiny. Hello? You have to choose your friends. You have to choose the people you, you work with. You know, as, as a youngster, I remember, I had a whole lot of friends. 
We were going to youth, we were going to Sunday school. We, we, we grew up in this time where everything was about God. I remember I was 14 years old and we had a, we had amongst our group, we had a, we had a, we had a band. I think the oldest person in the band was 16 years old. And the youngest person was 10 years old. And so we had a group of about 12 of us. When I say band, you'll say 12 people in the band. Yeah, the others were you know, carrying the instruments. Okay, not everybody was playing. <laughs> So they were part of the band. So we used to have all night prayer meeting. I'll never forget in my house, in the garage. It was empty at that point in time because the tenants just moved away. And so my mom didn't get any new tenants for the next six months. So we used that garage to have all night prayer meeting. We started all night. You know what's all night? All night or all night. You know what it is? We started at 10 o'clock and we didn't finish at 12. We finished 6 the next morning. From 10 o'clock to 6, to 6 the next morning. When I started going to church, they used to say ten, uh, all night prayer meeting. We used to get excited. It starts 10 o'clock, finishes at 12. And we say, what happens from 12 to 6? They say, go home and sleep. See, suddenly the mentality changed. Because we think it's too long to pray. We think that all night prayer should, must finish at 12 because we've got to do some things in the morning. Whenever you, you condition yourself for not finishing, what do you think will happen to anything you put your hand to? It will be an incomplete transition. You want to know why every time you put your hands to things and it doesn't work out? Because you give little to God. What do you, expe what do you expect in return? There's a demand for more. What does Matthew 16 tell you? Upon this rock I will build my church. You see the church of Jesus Christ and the church we have on the earth today are two different. The church of Jesus Christ know how to pray, they know how to preach, they know how to cast out devils. They know how to get into the fire and not faint. They know how to pursue, to, to continue to, to, uh, to, go, to go on and not hold back. They know how to talk to God, they know how to hear from God. They know how to sacrifice, they know what it is to give and how not to hold back. That's the church of Jesus. But when we talk about church, we talk about people. We have to crank them up to come to church. How many times do we have to make announcements for people to do things? When you, are, when you are sons of God, you become sons like Issachar. The sons of Issachar, they knew the seasons and they knew what to do. They were never commanded. You know why? Because when you're a son, nothing is because of command. It's because of purpose. You see, when you hear, he that has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You've got to be sharp this morning. Somebody say to your neighbor, I'm sharp. So when you are sharp, it means that you are able to pick things in the Spirit. And don't worry about the person next to you, please. Because when you stand for truth, let me tell you this, you will not be popular. When you stand for truth, you will not be popular. Nobody is going to like you. When Jesus stood for truth, they didn't like him. They plotted, they planned his death. At every, at every turn, they tried to conjure up stories, plot, to bring him down. But what did he stand for? Truth. Most people don't like truth. <laughs> I'll never forget somebody, we stood, sat with somebody, and we asked them, can you handle truth? Oh, pastor, you know what, we need some help, can you give us some advice? So yeah, sure. So we sit down, we talk to them. Can you handle truth? Yes, pastor, tell me like it is. Uh, tell me the truth because I need a del uh, you know, deliverance from this. I need a breakthrough. The moment you tell them the truth, that's it. They get upset. They don't tell you they're upset with you. You don't see them for, for some time. Three, four months. No phone calls. You don't see them. They don't come back to church. Then after three months and one day, they come with the tails in between their leg and they sit down. Hey, what happened? Where were you? Then they don't want to talk because they're embarrassed. Pastor, you know the day you told me that I was, actually the truth is, the truth is, I was offended. Truth will offend you. Truth will offend you. But do you know that when they asked Jesus all those questions, you know, you know what's the reason why he didn't answer all the questions that they threw at him? Because truth needs no defense. Truth is an absolute. It stands alone. Jesus is truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is truth. And so when you ask questions 
about Jesus, are you the son of God? There's no reason for him to answer. Because truth is an absolute. When people ask you funny questions, there's no reason for you to answer. Because truth lives inside of you. What does the Bible say about truth? He said, thy word is spirit and it is life. And so when the spirit and life come inside of you, which is the spirit of truth, what happens? The spirit of error leaves you. So all the things you think, that's an, that's an error. All the things that you do, that's an error. All the things that you say, that's an error. It's, it's a thing of the past. Moses's, Moses's order is becoming obsolete. The Ark of the Covenant was moving away from that position of Gibeon, Mount Gibeon, and it was moving away to another mountain, Mount Zion. Oh, come on, are you with me? This migration announced that the tabernacle of Moses was becoming obsolete. That means done away with, no longer in use, no longer useful. It's outdated, no longer relevant or current. This was a new move. Already one fatality was registered in the old move. Everybody knew what, were, what, what this fatality was. What, were, what, were, what was the fatality? Uzzah died. So David celebrated with an, with an unorthodox dancing and sacrifice. Tell me something. When God moves, are you going to think about, oh, my suit, my tie, my dress? Or are you going to just allow yourself to be in his presence? See, most people come today, they, 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 if, if God moves, they don't want to. When God moves, you've got to move. But what do we do? We are very conscious. We, we've, we've become cerebral. Everything is about the men, mentality, the mind. You look to the left, look to the right, who's watching me? I, I, you know, I can't outdo myself, I'm in church. Don't worry about somebody else. In fact, why are their eyes open in the first place? Or even if your eyes is open, why are you judging? Because when you come to church, it doesn't matter your expression of your face or how your body moves. You are celebrating. And so this is the problem we see right here in the king's presence. David gets so excited. Now remember, there's a special way, there are special characteristics that kings have to, have to, uh, have to carry themselves outward. Are you with me? There's a posture. There's a stature that they have to have. But when David came to his God, he said, I am not interested in earthly protocols. I'm interested in celebrating this God. He is now coming to our presence. Remember the Ark of the, of, the, of the Covenant was what? The presence of God. That's where God literally, physically lived on the earth when he was in the tabernacle. Am I right? The Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant was coming, which means God was coming into the camp of Israel and coming to Mount Zion. And so when David saw that, he said, God is coming to the place I prepared. Let me celebrate him. We don't celebrate when God comes. We look at other people celebrating. Hey, when God comes into a presence, when God comes into your life, there is no time for looking at other people. Why are you looking? You're not supposed to be a spectator. You're supposed to be in that zone yourself. And when David was dancing, you're supposed to go next to David and say, let's, let's go for it. Let's do it. Are you with me? The nation turned out to see. The nation turned out. The whole of Israel came out. But everybody came out for different reasons. Let's look at some of them very quickly. The nation of Israel came to see. What did they come to see? Number one, the Ark of the Covenant. Israel's greatest asset was on the move. That which was hidden in the most holy place became visible during this migration. Number two, Uzzah died before. Let's see if anybody else is going to die now. Number three, there was the this was the hero's vision. Who was the hero? King David. His vision was to bring the ark from Obadidim to this land. Now that it is coming, let's go see what our hero's vision is, is about. Let's go join him. Number four, it announced the, um, the tabernacle of Moses being obsolete. Number five, this was more than the slaying of Goliath. It was the slaying of Mount Gibeon mindset. It was more than the slaying of Goliath. Who slayed Goliath? King David, when he wasn't king, right? He was a boy. 
It was more than that. It was a slaying of Mount Gibeon mindset. For years, the nation went to Mount Gibeon to worship. Right? This migration announced the superiority of the ark to the mountain. In other words, we're taking the ark out of the, out of the mountain of Gibeon and we're bringing it to where? Mount Zion. That mountain right now where it used to be has no significance. Oh, come on. I, I don't think you heard that. Yet, there will be people. The ark moved, but the people still go to Mount, Mount Gibeon. To the actual mountain. The mountain was just a place the ark was in. The ark moved. Why are you still going back? People, when God moved, I don't know why some people still stuck in the old. Oh, we used to do this 20 years. Who cares about your 20 years? I remember when I was working for F-Man Bedding, I was a senior production planner there. And one of the guys, I, I went down with the complaints clerk, we went down to the wood department, and I had tried to solve a problem between the complaints clerk and the wood department manager. And so this argument was going between the two, and so the, 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 <laughs> the um, wood department manager said to the young man, he said, hey boy, you know nothing. I'm working here 20 years. I got 20 years experience in this company. The young man turned around, held his thoughts for a second, and said, you, sir, you may have 20 years experience. That's what you think. But actually speaking, you got one year experience 20 times. You know, that's the problem with a lot of people. They think of the old and they say, oh, we've been doing this for so many years. So what? You've been in the same old ritual and you're stuck. When God moves, you've got to move. When God moves, you've got to move. God moved from Mount Gibeon. He's gone to Mount Zion. What are you still doing in Mount Gibeon? Even the ark is no more there. Because the ark was, was the presence of God. So when the presence of God moved, why are you still stuck with tradition? Oh, we were born in this land. We will die in this land. God said to Abraham, take your family and leave your father's house and go. Ask him to leave one land because we're going to give him something better. But when you're stuck with old tradition, it's very dangerous. Somebody say to your neighbor, it's dangerous when you're stuck in tradition. Okay, let's look at this. But Mikhail stayed at home. She chose to be a spectator rather than a participant. As she saw David dancing before the ark, the presence of the Lord, she despised him in her heart instead of standing with her husband. Come on. That's why when you are married, you are partners in destiny. You must support each other. It's important. And I'm not talking about each other in church. I'm talking about each other in everything. That means how you support each other through whatever they're going. They must be there for each other. Are you with me? You must, must be able to put your hand even if it's not your vision. Oh. Very little amens I'm getting. Mervyn. Amens only coming from this corner here and the front. Okay. Can I hear an amen for this? That when you come together as, as partners in destiny, you support each other. God says, one will move her. A thousand. Put a thousand to flight. Two will put. You saw that multiplication. And if husbands and wives can only understand that, if partners in destiny can only understand that, we will kill giants. Right now we're killing each other. She chose to be a spectator. Do not choose to be a spectator. Be a participator. Okay, so let's quickly look. I've got five to seven minutes, right? Let's look, the, look at the characteristics of a Mikhail spirit. The characteristics of a Mikhail spirit. I'm, I'm going to go very fast with this. Number one, she was missing in action. M-I-A, missing in action. You all saw the movie, Chuck Norris. One, two, and three. <laughs> okay, missing in action. Because sometimes in church, as far as we look around and we see, there's a, there's a lot of M-I-A's, evangelists. A lot of M.I.A.s, those who are missing in action. Why? Where are they? Doing their own thing. So, instead of Mikhail being with their husband, because the ark of the Lord was coming, the procession was taking place, there were 10,000 singers already set up, besides those who are playing the harps and the trembles and, and, and the cymbals and the timbrels and all the other musical instruments. If 10,000 were only singers, I can imagine what that band looked like, what that worship team looked like. Yo, I would have loved to be in the center of that. And so all of this was carrying on. 
David got excited in the midst, and he went right in the center, and he began to dance until his outer robe came off, but he wasn't bothered. Why? Because God was right there. Because God was right there. Are you with me? And guess what happened? This lady was standing in the house, spectating, drew the curtain and said, look at my husband, moving with the girls, the sisters and the church. But what spectacle was she looking from? From a carnal, critical, physical spirit. What does she, what does she do? She criticizes the men. But we'll get there just now. Number two. Let's look at verse, go back to 1 Samuel. Verse number 23. And Mikhail. Do, Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Basically, she was barren, right? She was barren. What does it speak about? Infertility. Now, this is very important. When you have that kind of spirit, where everything is shut off, it means you are dry, you are barren. You do not have the ability to produce the next generation. Why? Because God made it so. Because if he gives you that ability, what are you going to do? You're going to raise up after your own kind. What kind are you? You are hostile towards your husband. You're hostile towards the king. You're not a worshiper. Instead of worshiping with him, you became a spectator in the church. He was hostile to God. When you become hostile to the people that are praising and worshipping, you become hostile to God. Now, go quickly, if I've got the time. Come with me to Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you something, right? Genesis chapter 1, and look at verse number 24. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind. According to their kind. Let's look at the next scripture. Go below that and you'll see livestock, creatures that move along the ground, wild animals, each according to its kind. Verse 25. God made wild animals according to their kind. But read verse 26. This is your key. Then God said, let us make man in our image. For everything else, he said, after their kind. But when it came to man, he said, after our image, after our likeness. What is that? The likeness of God. The ability to, to speak and things to come into place. The ability to create. The ability to bring life where there is no life. Are you with me? Everything that God is, we were supposed to be. Oh, come on. That's what we were supposed to be. So what do we do on earth? We are supposed to rule, to reign. We have dominion on the earth. Right now, you're supposed to be rulers, but we are being ruled. You're supposed to be those who dominate, but you are being dominated. Well, God made you more. He made you for more. Are you with me? So why, why does God shut her home? Because he said, if she produces after her kind, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to have more and more people of hostility and barrenness. That's why when you look at, uh, uh, when you look at, in 1 Samuel, you look at Elkanah, the, the, the priest, and he had two wives. What were their names? Hannah and Penina. Hannah was what? She was barren. But why did God open her home? Because her heart was right. When you set your heart on the things of God, even though she had hostility from Penina, what happened? God opened up a womb so that she gave birth because in her, there was righteousness found in. So when righteousness is found in you, you'll give birth to a Samuel. You'll be the judge of Israel. You'll be the one that will link heaven on earth. And in Samuel's day, the Bible says, there was peace in all of Israel. And yet he was not a military man. After Samuel comes Saul. Then they go into warfare. After Saul comes David, they go into more warfare. These were militant men, men of warfare. They come into power, war starts. There's a man of God. He's a priest. He's a judge. And in his day, there was peace. What is God saying? God is raising peacemakers. You guys. In a time of war, in a time where there's too many militants around you, you'll be the one like Samuel. You'll carry the Samuel legacy. You'll carry the Samuel anointing. You'll carry the Samuel grace. As you speak things of peace. 
will come into your land, into your house, into your business, and into everything you put your hand to. But most people don't believe this. Why? Because you look at the systems of this world. Right now, when you look at South Africa, you feel depressed, right? That's your problem. You feel depressed because of what's going on there. But if you stand in Zion, suddenly everything changes because you're seeing from a different place. Listen to me. When the children of Israelites was in Egypt and when all the famine was taking place, what happened in Goshen? The people were protected. When everything was haywire around, what happened in Goshen? It was absolutely well. Somebody say, it's well with my soul. I'm closing. Say it is well with my soul. In the time that we're living in, Goshen, Goshen is our place. Remember, no matter what's happening, remember, we are living in times where Papa's, Papa Jonathan's prophetic word is now coming to pass. The seven years of plenty, we right now in the year 2022. It means we are on the seventh year, but he did say plus minus two years. That means 2024. We still got two more years of bringing in the harvest. Go back to Genesis when you go home. Genesis 41 and see what God says. Joseph gathered all the stock from the land and he had cities that were filled to the brim where he had barns filled to the brim in every city. And when the days of famine came, after the seven years of plenty, when the days of famine came, what did David do? He sold the grain to the people that were in need. Ha. Huh. Seven years of plenty. We're coming to the five years of the lean cow. It's actually started. The five years of the lean cow has started because what do you see in the lean cow? Economic suppression, depression. We're going to see mergers. We're going to see failures of companies. COVID already showed us that. We're into the five years of lean cow. But the next thing is the five years of the bleeding, uh, sorry, the four years of the bleeding cow. It's when things are going to be so bad that your money is going to actually buy very little. And the last three and a half years is the year of the dead cow when the, when the actual currency falls flat, when it's got no value, like Zimbabwe. The currency in Zimbabwe, which was the Zimbabwe dollar, has no value at the moment. The U.S. dollar is coming to the place. People, I'm warning you now, and your father's been warning you, we've still got a few more years for the years of plenty. But we have already overlapped with the year of lean. Please know what to do in the season and in the time. Amen? Amen? Okay, for one minute, let me try and rush this, all right? Uh, Mikhail, well, what, what is the story of Mikhail? She only saw David from her eyes. But the moment David began to worship the Lord, he didn't see her. I want you to move your eyes away from the people that suppress you and depress you and want to take your joy away and move your eyes to God. Because I tell you, when you move your eyes to God, you will see, what will you see? You will see victory, you will see breakthroughs, you will see God's order that will come in. Somebody say, God's order is above everybody else's order. I'm coming in. So redefining the years. The church has to be intensely passionate. Now we're coming into, the, into what? We're coming into the right order. Somebody right order? Say right order. We're coming into the complete transition. The church has to be intensely passionate in the heart and the spirit of worship. You have to become a worshipping church. That's why I like worship. Every time I come here, I enjoy the worship because you know how to worship. But don't let the worship service become a worship only in service. Worship is 24, 7. Is going on all the time in your heart. The church must be accurately built on God's habitation and not God's visitation. Gone are the days when we say, oh, Tuesday is going to be the hour of power. We're going to come and we're going to have God come and visit us. No, God doesn't visit us. He's not a guest. He's not a special guest. He lives in us. Are you with me? He lives in us. We don't invite God. You can't invite somebody that's already in your presence. Am I right? So God must live in you. Say, say to your neighbor, God is living in me. The church must be baptized in the spirit of truth. In other words, think truth, speak truth, feel truth, sense truth, promote truth. Shut down the negative thoughts. Anybody who speaks lies, stay away from them. The church must become a prophetic voice of hope for a better future. Every time you speak, it must be a, a, a voice that will bring some kind of hope, some kind of blessing to somebody. Learn how to put your hands around somebody. And I'm not talking about physical. Putting your hands around somebody is talking about your attitude of uh, uh, accepting other people. Not everybody is like us. Uh, come on. Not everybody is like us. We know how to pray. We know how to, we are, we know how to connect to God. But not everybody is like that. So when you see other people in that state, you bring them in. You must show them the way to God. You must show them the way to 
purpose and destiny. The church must be have a restore, restored voice for nations. Restored voice for national affairs in our own country. Somebody say, voice for the nation. And I'm not talking about politics, okay? We are talking about having a community mentality, getting involved in strategic affairs in the community. But how, how do you get involved? Get involved in town planning, parent-teacher committee, social transformation initiatives, sporting bodies. You know, the only thing we do is we want to sing, praise, and clap, and be in church. There are many things that we need to be out there. Somebody say, I need to be out there. But that don't go there for the sake of a position. If you are not a worshiper, you're not a child of God, you're not a son of God, and you go there, you, you will mess it up. But when you are a son of God, you will be a Jehu in that place, you'll be a Joseph in that place, you'll be a Shadrach, Meshach, Ebenezer, and a Daniel in that place. You'll bring change. Stand with me. Hallelujah. Let's build a kingdom way. Can you build a kingdom way? Your church must become a territorial force in the city. I believe that Pure Fountain Family Church is already a territorial force. But you want to be a greater force, we need more to come in, come in strong. There must be a pattern in this house where everybody comes in and see the pattern and move into the pattern. Step into the pattern, come into the pattern and you will become the voice wherever you go. When you step into the pattern and you leave this place, the pattern goes with you. The voice goes with you. The spirit goes with you. The dynamics goes with you. The grace goes with you. The power goes with you. The anointing goes with you. So wherever you go, you don't even realize how much of authority and power you have. You stand next to somebody at work, in a business or wherever you are and things will start to take place in them. I went to visit a family once and they, and they said to me, Papa, you came into this place and I felt something inside of me surge like, like, like fire on the inside of me. I said, good. God is burning up every wood stock, I mean wood stubble and hay inside of you. The fire of God is there to do what? To burn up anything that is not of God and to give you the grace to, to, to go to the next level. Are you people of this house? Are you people of this house? When you are people of this house, then you are a great people. If you are people of this house, it means you're a great people. And if you're a great people, you must go out and make great people. That's your job, is to make great people. Not to go there and say, I am great. You are nothing. No, when great makes great. In fact, great makes greater. Jesus said, greater works shall you do. And so when, if I am great, that means the people I go to, I must make them greater than me, better than me, so that we can have a better community, better uh, nation. Hallelujah. And the last one, the presence of God. We must capture, captivate the presence of God. We must do everything so that God is the centrality of our lives, of our church, our business, our homes. Hallelujah. I want you to lift up your hands, hallelujah. Let's just spend the next few seconds just worshiping the Lord in praying tongues. Just, just push in tongues, just push in tongues. Hallelujah, just push in tongues. Come on, come on, you can do better than that, hallelujah. We worship you, we praise you. Korobo Shekele Banda Rabo Sete, Libran Dorobo Sika, Labru Sokorobo Ndorobasete, Labrun Korobosh, Karabas Sekele Bende, Itarabuso Kolobon Norabayanda, Lababa Rashu Korobo Yende, Labra Sekele Bondo Robo Sete, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Robon Dorobo Yanda Lama Sete Rebo Yende, Korobo Shekele Banda Laba Sete, Robo Shiki Rabayanda Laba Sanda. Raba baba baba satere boyondo kira bayande le mondo robo shitara bayande hallelujah hallelujah the kingdom of god is here righteousness peace and joy let the evidence begin kingdom community advancing without fear you 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 will come into a kingdom lifestyle touching lives far and near this is a word for this church your harvest will see rewards your of your tireless labor you will see miracles that will begin. You will see prayers answered, healings demonstrated, demons defeated, circumstances changed, lives transformed, communities influenced, cities impacted. Come on, the kingdom is here. You are here. God is here. And you're going to do great exploits for him. Give him praise. Hallelujah.